So I want to ask you, and maybe we can have a discussion. What does the word authentic mean to you? What does what does it bring to mind? What does authentic mean when you hear that word authentic? What does that original? Original, original. Okay, that's really good. Anything else? What does a, authentic mean? Um, realness. Realness, realness. I love that. That's so good. So we've got original, realness. Anything else? What's authentic? Openness. Openness, openness. Genuine. Yeah. Genuine. Yeah, so it's also an emotion as well, isn't it? Being authentic, genuine. So if I said to you, what does authentic church look like? What would you think? What is authentic? What does it mean to you when you when you open this book? What what would it be if we were stuck in a desert island and we just had this? How would it look? I wonder. I want to explore that with you today. <clears throat> because again, when we're not trying to create a vision, we're wanting his vision. A few little questions. So what is church? Is it a building? Is it a people? Is it you? Is it both? I mean, we've already heard some phenomenal ideas, great ideas. But what, 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 is, what is this thing that we call church that we, that we do? What is it? What is it? Is it that building that we see in that picture there? Or is it people? So here is the Webster's Dictionary. It says, a building for public and especially Christian worship. That's interesting, isn't it? That's what the official word says. But is it that? It's interesting. And it goes on to talk about clergy, an official religious body. Is that what we think authentic church is? I wonder, what do you think? What do you think? So when Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church, is he starting a building fund? Or a building project? Or have we got some conflicting ideas here between the Webster and what Jesus is doing? What do you think? Do you think he's went in to start a building project in the local town? Or is it something interesting, isn't it? Because we meant to, you know, we go to this thing all the time. So that's a, that's a really good question is, what is church and really fundamental if we are saying I am church that needs to be something that we need to discuss so I want to talk about that so what is Jesus building what did Jesus have in mind rather than a dictionary I think the son of God might just have a trump on the Webster dictionary and what we currently experience it and so if we started to understand what he had in mind I wonder if we would get a clearer vision of what church is so Jesus uses this very specific word here called ecclesia has anybody give us a wave if you've ever heard of that word ecclesia yes yeah, so we've heard some of those words there so I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it it's a fascinating term do you know that because it's actually a non-religious secular word back in jesus's day i don't know if you know he's jewish and they're under the tyranny of rome and this ecclesia belongs to rome see jesus obvious choice was to say i will build my synagogue or i will build my temple but he doesn't do that he says i will build my ecclesia so what what's what's going on i mean this is a secular term and jesus is using it and the fascinating thing that you need to understand here because he's he's really clever how jesus does this he coins this term and so what you had is you had 
the kingdom of Rome, and wherever two or three gathered, whether it was in Rome or anywhere in the world, you would create an ecclesia. Doesn't matter, just two or three Roman citizens, and you would create an ecclesia. So today we're gathering on Zoom, and we are creating this thing called ecclesia here virtually. So that was how the Roman structure would happen. And you often see this through the journeys of Paul when they find out he's a Roman citizen through Acts. They're like, oops, okay, because he was bringing the authority of the kingdom of Rome with him as a Roman citizen. So when Jesus was super smart, what he's doing is he's grabbing this idea and he's saying, this is how my kingdom works. He was saying, hey, wherever to. So what he does is he pushes out Rome and he teaches on the kingdom of heaven. Well, we know that the Gospels talk about the kingdom of heaven all the time, more than any other topic. He didn't need to talk about church because everybody understood what Ecclesia is. That's why he doesn't talk much on the topic. He talks about the kingdom because he's swapping out the Roman kingdom for his heavenly kingdom so that's why he uses this word ecclesia i will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell should not prevail against it it's really interesting for us because what he says is is that we get to have his authority here on earth we get to sit under him so Whatever resources Jesus has, we have. That's actually what he's saying. It's like, we get the resources of the kingdom of God here and now. Have you ever thought that through? So whatever Jesus has, we had. Whatever he could do, we can do. We have the authority of heaven and we have access to all of its resources. Now, isn't that amazing? Isn't that phenomenal? Isn't that surprising? And isn't he clever? So, after Pentecost, how did the New Testament church look? How did it look? Well, here it is. We know that after the Spirit descended on Pentecost, the disciples formed house churches. And the reason they did that is because they were modeling the strategy of Jesus. See, because if we jump back into the Gospels and we read Luke 9, Luke 10, and Matthew 10, we see Jesus describes how he wants his mission, how he wants his ecclesia to go forward. And then that's the bit where he sends out the 12 disciples and then later sends out the 72. He told us to go to houses. So it's obvious that if the disciples had been trained in that way, that we would see that reflected in the pattern of the early church. And so that's what they did. You see, we are the ecclesia. We are under heaven. And so wherever we are, I am his church in, my, in our neighborhoods, in my street, at work, and to my friends. And so this is the strategy that Jesus gives us and we see this modeled in Acts isn't it fascinating look at all of those scriptures in Acts where did they gather Acts 2 house to house Acts 5 house to house Acts 8 house after house Acts 10 Cornelius's house Acts 12 Mary's house and it goes on and on and on and so you can see Jesus had a pattern here the disciples weren't being smart they just go, you know, we're going to follow what you did. And in fact, the first three centuries of our Christian faith followed this pattern. Isn't that interesting? It's very different than what we got today. But isn't it also interesting that in the first three centuries, we probably had one of the most rapid growth ever. And so my question is, is, could Jesus be teaching a pattern that the disciples followed that we are perhaps missing out? So, how did it become something different? That's a good question, right? 
How did it end up with what we got today? How did the Webster Dictionary get to dictate what it means when Jesus had a different idea? Now that that would be a good question. That would be the natural next question. Well, when the King James Bible was translated, William Tyndale used the word Ecclesia, which is the right word. We find that King James was displeased with that because it allowed ordinary folks like you and me to sit under the authority of the kingdom of heaven. And so this idea of Ecclesia challenged his sovereign rule. And so basically he set derivatives to swap out that word and put the word church in. They swapped out Ecclesia and replaced it with church. And so ordinary folks would sit under the Church of England and his kingdom rather than the kingdom of heaven because he wanted to control. Isn't that fascinating? And so this whole idea of church gets translated within the King James authorised version, which is the, the translation with the word churching, and it gets sent the width and the length and the height of the British Empire. And everybody starts to believe that a church is a clergy with a building. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And so this idea of church becomes that thought exported everywhere. And that actually was working perfectly well. And, and God's a God of grace, isn't he? And he's quite happy to work within those systems. And that pretty much worked up to World War II. And you see the church and the state are intertwined. But you know what God does is just as Moses was to strike the rock in one season, the next season God had a different plan and he wanted Moses to speak to the rock. And so what God does in one season is good and he works through those things, but we are in a new season and God is doing something else. And so when he changes, we are also called to change. And so I don't want to labour too much on this, but we are now in a post-Neo-Roman culture and the church is dying. And here is just some kind of facts. Um, and it's not to make you feel depressed, but it's to show us some statistics about what's happening. The CBN News says 70 to 75% of British under 30 have no faith. Faith survey says that with the continual rate of decline, that UK Christians, born Christians, would be zero by 2067. So Ethan, if that statistic's right, by the time you're 60, church will be gone. And this is based upon the last 40 years worth of stats. Daily Mail, this is not just in the UK, but the Daily Mail says the majority of 16 to 29 year olds across Europe are non-religious studies show. That's across Europe. And in the faith survey, I think this was 2014, so it's a little bit old data. You can see the statistics that even in the US, it has fallen 8.4% over seven years. So what's happening? What does that mean for us? What does this, what does that mean? Is that all scary stuff? Or, or is God doing something else? What is it telling us? And I think it's important to ask that question. What it's telling us is don't go sailing down that road. <laughs> do, 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 do you get, don't, don't, it's, it's telling us that the river's dry there, you know, and that isn't the direction. It's saying don't hit the rock anymore. It's time to speak to the rock. It's guiding us away from the traditional and maybe God's starting to answer our prayer because he wants to bring us back to revival. That's what we've been praying, right? Back to how heaven designed it. Because if you're praying 
and you feel that you've got the church over you well you that's probably why you're not getting much power because we're not meant to take our authority from an institution we're meant to take our authority from heaven as Jesus taught and these are the reasons why I think the church will continue to decline and after the Second World War people didn't have much money so they went to church because they didn't have anything today but people have more money more freedoms and so we have developed a diverse set of hobbies and cultures and, and we know that and these have created subcultures whereby this invite people to church doesn't work because we're diverse we're very diverse we've got um, Simon with his camera that likes to take videos we've got Mandy with her singing you've got Ethan with his gaming we are a very diverse people and so this kind of go to church thing just doesn't have the same kind of hold as it used to have anymore and we all know it and the other thing is that the state and the church are further apart so people don't feel the responsibility to go to it so these are just genuine facts that we all have to own and go okay I understand that's that's just how life is um, but it does put responsibility upon our day and what we will do so I want to jump back into the New Testament and give us some really good news because in this in the New Testament of model in similar conditions it absolutely thrived now you're gonna be shocked and I'm gonna try and unpack this and you're just gonna go what so let's have one example in Acts here we are and it was read at the beginning today so Paul was in Ephesus and he's there in two years look at this and all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord so that is about 5 to 15 million people so in two years you're telling me he was able to reach 8 to 15 million people how on earth is that logistically possible and the thing is is that there, it's with our current traditional model of church it's impossible isn't that a mind-blowing scripture whose brain is absolutely frazzled right now it's like ah, how comes i've never seen that i mean I, when i looked at that i thought how comes i've never seen that scripture so within two years it says he reached everyone so i'm going to tell you how they did it they did it through this thing called oikos oikos is a new testament word oikos is a Greek word and it's translated household but it means more than that it means your sphere of influence it means neighbors co-workers friends within whom we come in contact everybody has an oikos you have an oikos it is this household connection that God has given us everybody has one God has engineered everybody to have it and so this is how we did it so Paul had his oikos Timothy, Silas, Priscilla, you've seen some of those names, and then they had their oikos. And so everybody was just loving up on the people next door to them. And within two years, that was possible. What do you think about that? It's fascinating, isn't it? So my question is, what would happen if we placed our oikos our sphere of influence on heaven's altar what happens if we were intentional about it and we mapped it out and prayed over it how many people could come to know this love story and I wonder what would happen if we followed the book rather than a clever idea so this is a survey done of 100,000 Christians over 50 denominations in 128 countries. And they asked this one question. What factor has been the greatest influence on your decision to become a Christian and to be part of the church? 
What do you think of those results? Special needs, helping people with special needs, one to three percent. People just walking off from the door, two to four percent. Pastoral staff, having pastoral staff in your church equals zero to three percent. Telemarketing, those adverts on the TV, 0.5 to 1%. Tent crusades, 0.5 to 1%. And obviously other church programs, that could be home groups or something like that, 2 to 4%. But look at this, 75 to 90% happens through Oikos. think that through that person next door to you that person at school how comes we've missed it so our question is what would happen if we decided to adopt a oikos strategy for our friends our neighbors relatives work colleagues schools and acquaintances what would our neighborhood start to look like would that be something you'd be willing to do? The next question would be is, how does this look? I think it looks like this. I feel that in my heart that's what Jesus wants to do I feel like a desire that I want to make him famous I want to make his love famous so the question must be next is then how do we do that into today's society I mean obviously there's gonna to have to be some logistics you know doing something like this doing something for your neighborhoods on your own it's likely to be difficult because of time resources we all live busy lives so I think there's a need to create some kind of watering hole a, a missionary organization and if you want to say if you took church and just flipped it completely upside down where it wasn't about trying to hold you in but it was about releasing other people just how they did in this book, in Acts, for them to go off and express themselves, how they felt called. I think that's oikos. I think that's how Paul did it. I think that's how Jesus did it. And if it's good for them, I think it can be good for us. But there are 
some logistics. For instance, if you wanted to hold, let's just say you felt that you wanted to hold a do an outreach in your local community, we would probably need to set up a charity because there would be some access to certain kind of areas. And so that's actually what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a missionary organization that does it act style, that releases people. So if you wanted to do a party down your road with your neighbors, we could bring resources in for that, whether that would be marketing or if you wanted to kick something off or where you could connect with people. I don't know how that looks. Whatever Jesus has got in, inside of your heart, that's between you and the Holy Spirit. The question is, is how do we release those things? And the Bible talks about the fivefold giftings and they are designed not to huddle you into this little box, which people call church, but to release you into the fullness of what God has done. And so that's what we want to do. And we believe that that, could be a source to help release oikoses all over the place. I wonder if we went after that, and of course there's a growing, and we're still uncovering it and trying to brush off the dust and start to see things in a new way. But if we got it right, how could your neighbourhood look in two years? a question isn't it if it worked in here why can't it work today if it's true that 75 percent plus of people come to know jesus through you it seems to me that the bible's got it right and the webster dictionary and king james perhaps has got it wrong and so I want to ask you, if you will, to do something. I want to ask you, if you've got your phone, to set your alarm two minutes past ten, just as he asked us to. And then he said to them, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. And then Jesus says, therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And it's just about us turning our gaze to him and to what he sees. <laughs>